Hello and welcome to Inside the Americas. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Good to have you with us coming up. It's the home stretch before the US midterm elections. The Democrats building momentum as they prepare for battle with hopes of retaking control of the House pinned on flipping key battleground districts. In the wake of the horrific anti-Semitic attack in Pittsburgh, US leader Donald Trump is under increasing pressure to come out and denounce white supremacy. Amid accusations, his controversial rhetoric is fueling the fire of hatred. And tragic and disastrous, conservationists lash out at Brazil's president-elect Jair Bolsonaro over plans to merge the agriculture and environment ministries. They claim the Amazon rainforest will be under threat. Well, we kick off the show with our number of the week. 40% of 18 to 29-year-olds in the US say they'll be voting in the midterm elections on Tuesday. That's according to new data released by the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. It's also a massive increase on numbers in that age group who cast their ballots in 2010 and 2014. With that crucial midterm fight just days away, experts are predicting that the Democrats could regain control in the House of Representatives representatives if they can flip enough key battleground districts known as red pockets. Our correspondents have more. Being here 10 days to go before we flip the 48, right? Final stretch at Harley Ruder's headquarters. This Democrat aims to unseat 30-year Republican incumbent Dana Rohrbacher. What does he say about homelessness? It's a lifestyle choice. His position on homeowners not having to sell their homes to LGBTQ individuals. Yes, he did say that. He supports offshore drilling off our beautiful coast. And we're not going to let him do that, are we? No. no. Supporters are targeting sympathizers who might not plan to vote and to win over those who voted Republican for Congress before but don't like President Trump. Historically, Orange County has been extremely conservative, but we're here to flip the district. The Republicans that lived here and always have are not the same ones that are being represented by Trump. Voters here resoundingly rejected Donald Trump for president two years ago. This district's congressional representative is one of Trump's most fervent supporters. We have a lot of moderate Republicans who have joined our campaign. In fact, you'll even see signs out in the area that say Republicans for Harley. And, and again, that is, uh, shows how extreme Dana Rohrabacher has become, as well as even Donald Trump. And there are people here that are saying enough is enough. Orange County embodies America's newest political divide, a traditional Republican enclave in a deeply Democratic state. At an early voting station where people are already casting ballots, the contrast is clear. I'm a strong conservative Christian, and uh, I just want our nation to be one nation under God. We need to make some changes here with the, with the current leadership. we got to make that change, and that's why i got to be here. The candidates are neck and neck in the polls. So a Democratic Party superstar has come to help. The mayor of Los Angeles lends a hand in Orange County's Latino neighborhoods. Gracias por su apoyo. Gracias. Latinos usually support Democrats, but don't always vote. Latinos are now 50 percent of the population in the area, but many times have not had a voice that stands for them. Right now we have a, a president and Congress who are literally dividing this country based on ethnicity, based on immigration status. We know in these communities how strong family is and we will protect those families. You guys want to take a picture of the next congressman? None of the Orange County Republican candidates we contacted allowed us to follow them, perhaps a sign of how nervous they are about a democratic wave. We'll be following those midterms very closely here on France 24 with a special edition of Inside the Americas from Washington. So uh, make sure you tune in for that next week. U.S. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump paid their respects to the Jewish worshippers who were shot dead at a synagogue in Pittsburgh last weekend. That's our photo of the week. But their visit to the Tree of Life temple wasn't without controversy, with thousands of protesters hitting the streets in anger. Critics of Trump are pointing fingers and claim his divisive inflammatory rhetoric is partly to blame for the rise in white nationalist violence. 
Well, calls are growing louder for Trump to explicitly denounce white supremacy. The U.S. leader and his administration have refused to acknowledge any possible link between the words he speaks or tweets and a growing emboldened white nationalist movement. Trump's opponents accusing him of dividing the nation and fanning the flames of violence and hostility. Erin Ogunkier has more. After the deadliest attack on Jews in American history, a time for reflection. Faced with a rise in racial and political violence, many say politicians' increasingly divisive rhetoric is to blame. We do need to have strong leadership from all of our elected leaders, not any one person, all of them from all political parties. That when you speak language of hate as a leader, you give permission to all people to say it's okay to speak that way, to treat people that way. The Anti-Defamation League says anti-Semitic violence and harassment in the U.S. spiked by 57 percent in 2017 alone, the steepest increase the organization has ever recorded. We are seeing an environment in which anti-Semitism has moved from the margins into the mainstream as political candidates and people in public life now literally repeat the rhetoric of white supremacists. And they think it's normal and permissible to talk about Jewish conspiracies, manipulating events or Jewish financers somehow controlling activities. But despite an undeniable rise in far-right attacks, the White House denies that Donald Trump's rhetoric has any role to play. I think the president has uh, had a number of moments of bringing the country together. Once again, I'll remind you that the very first thing the president did was condemn the attacker, and the very first thing the media did was blame the president. Uh, you guys have a huge responsibility to play in the divisive nature of this country. The massacre at the Pittsburgh synagogue followed two other acts of political and racial violence in the U.S. Last Wednesday, a white man gunned down two African Americans at a supermarket after he unsuccessfully tried to enter a black church. The killings are being investigated as possible hate crimes. And earlier last week, Caesar Sayuk, a known Trump supporter, sent 14 pipe bombs to prominent Democrats and outspoken critics of the president. To Brazil now, where far-right president-elect Jair Bolsonaro is planning to merge the ministries of agriculture and environment, setting off alarm bells for environmental activists. They say the move is disastrous and will endanger the Amazon rainforest, the largest in the world. Critics claim business interests will take top priority and overpower conservation concerns. Peter O'Brien explains. Brazil's next president brings new questions about the fate of the Amazon rainforest. Jair Bolsonaro's chief of staff has confirmed he's pushing ahead with a plan which is worrying for environmentalists. The agricultural and environmental ministries will be merged, as was planned from the beginning. Critics say the move risks undermining the environment ministry's concerns in favor of commercial production. Bolsonaro, who's supported by the agribusiness lobby, has called for more dams and mining in the Amazon basin. He opposes increasing the number of protected areas and wants to reduce federal prosecutions for environmental crimes. <laughs> WWF says that by purifying the air and water, Forests are vital to ensuring the long-term health of the economy. There is no way for us to get out of the economic crisis by destroying the Amazon, closing it down or increasing emissions. Soon the country will realize that if this happens, it will have an inverse effect on our economic growth. The president-elect has said he's open to negotiation on the issue. Recently, he reversed his suggestion that Brazil would pull out of the Paris Agreement on climate change, and he backs the solar and wind industries. But in Brazil, the biggest factor affecting global warming is the Amazon. It contains around a tenth of the world's natural carbon stores. In the last 50 years, 20 percent of it has been cut down. Staying in Brazil, the country's burgeoning middle class is spending more money on bulletproof cars. The second-hand market for these vehicles has seen a boost in recent times, especially in the financial hub of Sao Paulo, where residents are looking for new ways to stay safe, with the death toll from violent crime earlier this year hitting a record high. An army of cars rolls along the streets of Sao Paulo. 
Latin America's largest city. A little known fact is that many of them actually are bulletproof. Brazilian lawyer Mauricio Paulo says these cars are a must have in the face of high crime rates. As in any big city, violence is always near. You can lose your life over a simple violent act. Brazil's bulletproofing industry is thought to be the world's largest, raking in almost $250 million a year. Workshops like this one modify cars directly from factories, which can then withstand bullets from small firearms typical of smash and grabs. But the process costs $13,000 in an economy that is crawling out of a two-year recession. So many car buyers, like Mauricio, opt for second-hand. I don't like paying a lot of money for a car. So since I need an armored vehicle because of the lack of safety, I chose a used car because I will spend less money to move around with more safety. Sales of second-hand bulletproof cars have gone up, while the market for new ones shrunk by 20% last year. Low mileage used armored cars can sell for up to 40% cheaper. This is good news for the not-so-rich, says Fabio Cortesi, a commercial manager at a bulletproofing firm. The price of a used bulletproof car decreases faster, so the middle and even the lower classes can access the same level of protection and safety. Such cars have become a status symbol in Brazil, and the fear of violent crime persists, even if Sao Paulo state has the country's lowest crime rates. So despite a crisis in the auto market, these factors may help make the armoring industry a bit more bulletproof. Well, that's it for this week's edition of Inside the Americas. Thanks again for watching. Stay with us here on France 24. Lots more news coming up. Inside the Americas, presented by Jeannie Godula. From North America to the southern tip of Patagonia, join us for a look at the latest political, economic, cultural and social news from the Americas. Inside the Americas on France 24 and France24.com.